Okay, folks, you're all very, very welcome to the Clooney Foundation for Justice report launch of our Conflict Antiquities investigation today. Um, it's a report that contains research spanning two years, including hundreds of interviews with witnesses, informants, journalists, policymakers, forensic archaeologists, you name it. And the report has been compiled by my fantastic colleagues at the docket, whose bread and butter literally is to hold perpetrators to account. And that in non-Irish terms means just, that is they're squarely what they do best. So there are two main aims of this report and two key takeaways we want you all to go away with today. One is that the illegal trade of antiquities is not a victimless crime. That's a really, really important takeaway for you to, to take home with you today. And second, the team are really keen to ensure that dealers and galleries in Europe and the US are eventually held to account, those who have participated in this illegal trade in funding terrorism and crime like this. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you to my brilliant colleagues, Anya, Anya Neistat, who leads our DACA team, many of you will be familiar with, um, and also Antonia David and Manel Shiban, um, who are my brave and brilliant colleagues also on the docket and who were instrumental in this reporting. So we're going to spend the next 30 to 40 minutes going through our findings, and then at the very end we'll take questions from our audience here, and also we're being joined by, I'm told, nearly 200 people online which is a sign of the times. So without further ado, Anya. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for being here and also a warm welcome to those joining us uh, online. I would start by saying that uh, it is somewhat uh, unusual for us to hold a public event. Uh, that's not what uh, the docket team normally does. Normally we work directly with law enforcement agencies and with judicial authorities uh, to build investigations, to trigger prosecutions, and to support victims uh, in their uh, search for justice. But with this particular topic, we felt it was critically important at this particular moment to bring this to the public attention. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, we will present to you today what we can share publicly, but it comes after having shared uh, our findings, the dossiers, with the prosecutors uh, in a number of uh, jurisdictions, uh, and we're still supporting their investigations. But we do feel that these investigations, which we think are so important uh, to cut this business of illegal antiquities trade, will not be successful unless there is a very significant public attention to the issue, unless conflict antiquities start being seen just as tainted as blood diamonds or ivory trade or other forms of uh, illegal trafficking. And we don't have a feeling that people know much about it. Uh, let alone how harmful it is, and as Shauna mentioned, that there are actual victims of these crimes. Because we're not just talking about the destruction and looting of cultural heritage, we are talking about armed groups, in this case in the Middle East, but in many other places around the world as well, making profit that they then use to buy weapons, to recruit new members, and ultimately to commit atrocities in the countries where they operate and terrorist acts abroad. I'm bringing up this first slide because obviously Ukraine is very much on everybody's mind, but also to remind you that although our investigation focused on the countries in the Middle East uh, and North Africa, it happens in every conflict. Whenever there is war, whenever there is chaos, uh, there are always people who both target uh, monuments, historical sites, archaeological sites, uh, as part of uh, their warfare tactics, but also make profit from items looted there. And now, more specifically, uh, on our investigation. Uh, interestingly enough, we did not start this investigation with looking at the cultural heritage issues per se. 
Uh, there are many organizations, and we're very grateful to many of them for their support in this work. I know that some of them are actually in this room, who are specialists on cultural heritage, who've been following this issue for many years. For us, the angle was looking at the crimes committed in MENA and trying to understand how the armed groups operating there get financed. We looked particularly at ISIL, but also various other arms groups operating in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya, and Yemen. And almost to our own surprise, we found out that antiquities, the trade, the looting, the pillage of antiquities, of precious archaeological items, and their uh, subsequent sale is makes a significant, very significant part of this profit. To give you just one example for ISIL, for example, and we'll talk more detail about that, uh, they had three main sources of income, which was oil, ransom, and antiquities. And especially as they started losing territory and their access to uh, oil fields and ransom money um, was limited, antiquities became more and more prominent. And to, and to the extent that ISIL continues to finance itself today, which it does, a lot of that come from antiquities, and we're pretty confident um, about that. Um, very briefly, I'll share with you our key findings, and then we'll go in some detail with the help of my colleagues uh, to, uh, to share with you as much as we can share uh, publicly. Uh, so the, the, key, the key takeout was that we were not looking at some random opportunistic look, looting. Uh, we were not looking at some you know, small, small items uh, picked up here and there by people operating in this area. We were looking, especially in the case of ISIL, at an absolutely institutionalized looting of antiquities used as a weapon of war and as a major source of financing. The other thing that we found is that although there are multiple laws and regulations aimed at protecting cultural heritage and preventing it from getting uh, looted and sold in Western markets, this is simply not enough. It really continues unabated largely due to the existence of unregulated market where dealers, intermediaries, galleries pretty much continue operating unabated to this day. Uh, we also, uh, I guess that led us to think about what, what is one thing uh, or one extra thing that can be done to stop this uh, pattern. And what we found out is that currently, even when antiquities dealers uh, get caught red-handed with looted items, most that they face is restitution of the items or paying fines, and all of that basically is seen as the cost of doing business. And we believe that uh, they need to be prosecuted as potential accomplices to war crimes and finances of terrorism. Uh, in order to do that, we basically Uh, decided to put together a dossier to share with uh, law enforcement agencies that would make this link, that would basically show what is happening in those sites, what is the scale of the looting in these four countries, and how items get through a very complex network uh, of uh, intermediaries uh, and trafficking routes to European markets. And for that, we traveled to Syria, to Iraq, to uh, Turkey, to Lebanon, which are uh, very important um, um, countries, uh, transit countries uh, for looted antiquities, particularly from Syria and Iraq. And as you can see you know, in the bits of this video, um, we met with the smugglers, we met with the diggers, and were literally offered looted antiquities for sale. The reason uh, it was very important for us to carry out all this field work, which we then combined with very extensive open source investigations, is because this is what usually law enforcement agencies, state actors, cannot do or cannot do easily. They cannot just jump on the plane and go to Syria or jump on the plane and go to Iraq. And we, through our extensive networks, with, through partner organizations, uh, were able to fill out these gaps that they would have otherwise in their investigations. Yeah, so to speak a little bit more um, and break this down further and talk about the scale of the pillage that was happening on the ground. 
Um, so as Anya said, this is not the case of a few people digging in their backyard or excavating small sites and finding a few things and selling it for a couple thousand dollars. Um, if you look at what has been happening in these four countries that we focused on over the last decade, uh, there's been kind of systematic, large-scale looting operations that are actually institutionalized um, and kind of are systematically uh, going through cultural heritage items, both found in archaeological sites, which are very rich in items that are still um, buried and unexcavated, unexca um, and also in museums where items have been uh, stored and preserved. Um, so those are the two places we sort of focused on. And I'm sure you've seen some of these satellite images um, in the news as it was happening, but um, it's pretty stunning to see uh, hundreds of sites over time, if you compare when um, armed, group, armed groups moved into the area, um, and you do a comparison over a few weeks, just the amount of looting pits that appear um, in those sites. Um, so the um, there's a lot of examples that we have in the report, but I just wanted to kind of pull out three specific ones today. Um, the first of them is that in Syria, where um, one of our colleagues was uh, able to actually go out with one of the looting teams in around 2014. Um, they were looting there uh, under kind of the permission of one of the terrorist groups that was operating in the area at the time. And as you see sort of from the middle picture, um, they had tools, uh, metal detectors, excavation um, equipment that they were using to go through the site. And as you see from the map in the top right, um, this team also had uh, probably an, an archaeologist expert that had been recruited or coerced to join the team, which was a very common pattern, especially for ISIL, to kind of coerce uh, museum curators or archaeological site curators um, to identify sites and identify specific points in sites where there might be items uh, to dig for. Um, a second quick example is from Iraq. Um, so the uh, many of you probably remember um, the some of the propaganda videos that were coming out um, from ISIL destroying uh, Mosul Museum. Um, it's in the top right there, uh, kind of systematically going through smashing smashing statues. Um, what was not in the videos is that usually before uh, they would destroy these statues is that they would loot the museums. So kind of taking out any movable items that they could. Um, some of the statues were actually destroyed and others were just uh, broken down into smaller pieces to make it easier to transport out of the country. Um, and then finally from Libya, uh, a quick example. Uh, the Libyan case is interesting because of the funerary sculptures and deities, uh, like the one you see um, on the top right there. Um, these are uh, sculptures that are really unique based on kind of their um, artistic style and the, and the material they're made up of. Uh, so it's very easy to trace these items. So um, an archaeologist and researcher, Morgan Belgic, has uh, kind of looked at these specifically and identified over 100 of them that were taken out of Cyrene uh, between 2015 and 2016, uh, trafficked to Europe and the US, and are still circulating on the markets there. And it's so distinctive because it's very easy to trace these specific ones. OK. Um, so one of the things, obviously, for the purposes of our investigation uh, that was very critical uh, is to link the trade that is happening uh, in, in the West, in Europe, in the United States, to specific groups operating on the ground. This is one of the reasons we chose these specific four countries, because there we could really identify through uh, a lot of research, uh, both on the ground and open source, which groups controlled which sites at what point. And we have to be very clear, for some of the sites, for some of the items, we will never know. 
they chose hands, they, they changed hands too many times, and so it would not be possible to say, even if we know that this particular item comes from Syria, it would not be possible to say which group ultimately benefited from it. But then there are other examples, like uh, Mosul Museum that Antonia mentioned, where we know exactly that ISIL looted it. So every item, and we did get an inventory of items that are currently missing from the museum, so every one of these items that appears in a European or American gallery, we know who ultimately benefited from it. So in the report, there is a lot of information. We would not go through all of that. I do encourage you, there are lots of illustrations, both uh, online um, and online uh, materials uh, are already uh, available. There are lots of illustrations of uh, with maps, uh, some done by us, some done by other researchers, showing uh, which groups controlled which areas at what point in time. The other interesting thing that we found, uh, particularly with ISIL and to a certain extent with other groups, is really the what we call the bureaucracy of looting. Um, ISIL, as uh, I'm sure you know, was generally a very bureaucratic organization. Everything was very well structured and documented. And for the antiquities, based on some of the documents uh, that we were able to obtain, we could see the whole structure. They had a special department or sub-department for antiquities. They had a department for everything that comes out of the ground, be it agriculture or oil and a sub-department that dealt specifically with antiquities. They had offices in different places in different times, in Raqqa, in Mimbich, which we uh, visited, or whatever remains of them, uh, just a few months ago. And everything was documented. There was a very clear system of uh, taxation. So if you wanted to loot, uh, that was especially in the early stages, you had to obtain a license. And we have examples of some of these licenses. And uh, then, once you found an item, there were several ways, depending on the value. Either you could sell it, try to sell it to yourself and pay tax uh, to, uh, to the ISIL administration, or if it's very valuable, it was taken by ISIS, and then they are organized the sales themselves. And then it moved to a much more, again, we can see it in the documents. Actually, just now in Syria, uh, if, last month or two months ago, uh, we were able to um, get lots and lots of um, ISIS documents, and many of them are just receipts for purchasing of metal diggers uh, or excavators. So they did move to literally an industrial scale looting. We saw the sites where they use hydraulic pumps uh, to, and of course, you know, that leads to a complete destruction of the site in the end, and uh, it, it is mind-blowing, uh, uh, the sites that we visited in Iraq, like Hatra or Nimrud, when you think of uh, the sites that have been there for thousands of years, thousands of years, like Nimrud, which are some of the most important historical sites for humanity, not just for the Middle East, and what happened to them, but also constantly in the back of our mind and how much money they made out of everything they sold from those sites. Um, and just to be very clear, uh, the conflicts are continuing. Yes, ISIL lost its territorial control, but it's still quite active outside of the Middle East, as we know. But there are also other groups who are still operating to this day in the Middle East. We were actually uh, interviewing um, uh, one of the diggers, smugglers, who worked with uh, Hayat Takhtir al-Sham, so-called HTS group that currently controls uh, Idlib area, who was literally describing how the digging is ongoing. And it was exactly the same um, in Syria, just recently. It is going on to this day, and the other important point to remember is that the items that were stolen in 2014, 15, 16 are coming to the market now. There is always a cooling period for antiquities. You cannot just bring it, uh, although you would be surprised how easy it seems to be, uh, but normally you do not just take it from the ground and put it in a gallery. It usually cools off, uh, and so now some of the items looted by ISIS five, seven years ago are coming to the markets. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about prosecution of the war crime of pillage. Uh, so now it's time to talk about what it means, legally speaking. Uh, so just to start, um, I'll give a very broad and general definition of pillage, as you can see on the screen here, which is the stealing and taking of property without the consent of their owner. Now, what is a war crime? Um, so first, to start with international law, pillage has been long prohibited under international customary law, and that prohibition was enshrined by um, Article 8 of the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. And you can see that Article 8 includes the crime of pillage as a war crime, and you can see the definition on the screen here provided by that article. 
Um, but the ICC statute also qualify, uh, qualifies as a war crime any seizure of property of one's adversary or any intentional attacks on building dedicate to, dedicated to, among others, religion, education, uh, charitable purposes. So it's not only war, it's not only pillage that is a war crime under Article 8 of the Rome Statutes. Um, now the definition of war crime um, of pillage was expanded by the jurisprudence of international tribunals uh, throughout time, which determined that um, the form any forms any forms of appropriation, sorry, including acts of appropriation by any combatant, even when done in their own interest, uh, also qualify as a war crime of pillage. Now, under national law, um, pillage is also a criminal offense in most European jurisdictions, as well as in the United States. And I won't go into too much details right now, but you can find in our report a detailed legal analysis of some relevant jurisdictions and legal frameworks, especially in some market countries, key market countries. Now, at the institutional level, uh, the United Nations Security Council has adopted various resolutions uh, in 2015 and in 2017, where it specifically condemned the looting, the destruction, and the trafficking of Iraqi and Syrian artifacts and cultural property. In 2017, the Security Council recognized in particular that ISIL, among other armed groups, were generating income from engaging in the looting and smuggling of cultural heritage in Iraq and Syria, an income used, and I quote, to support recruitment efforts and strengthen their operational capability to organize and carry out terrorist attacks." End of quote. So the Security Council has therefore called on states time and again to take appropriate steps to prevent the trade of looted Syrian and Iraqi artifacts and mandate, mandated in 2017 the establishment of an investigative team um, to collect and preserve evidence for use in national courts of the international crimes that were committed by ISIL. So as you know, ISIL and other armed groups have not only committed the war crime of pillage, but have also committed uh, other atrocities that, um, among which unlawful killings, enforced disappearances, sexual assaults, and torture, which qualify as war crime when committed during armed conflict, and which qualify as um, which may qualify as crimes against humanity uh, when committed as part of a widespread and systematic attack against uh, the civilian population. And uh, the Yazidi people were uh, victims of those crimes, uh, and in particular, the crime of genocide. Ismi Zina, Najia Ezidia. Ado Fishabaka Najiat al Ezidiat al Tabi Ali Munadama Diazda. Tamad the Tandim Daash, Bill Kura. وبلدات السنجات ارتكبت أبشع الجرائم والإبادة والإبادة الدموية المروعة ضد الشعب الإيزيدي على أساس الهوية والدين تم اختتافي في ثلاثة من أب سنة 2014 من بيتي مع جميع أفراد أسرتي أنا كالكثير من الفتيات الإيزيديات تعرضت إلى شتى وأنواع العذاب من قبل الداعش عندما كنت في الأسر وأنا في الأسر كثيرا كنت أتساءل عن, عن من كان يمد الداعش بالدعم المالي ومن أين كانوا يحصلون على تلك الأسلحة؟ بما في ذلك الدول التي تاجرت مع الداعش للشراء أو بيع المعالم الثقافية الدينية الثمينة التي سرقها الداعش من المجتمعات وتاجروا بها لولا الدعم الذي كان يحصل عليها داعش لما كان مسير آلاف من الإيزيديين مجهولا ولما كان هناك أكثر من 80 مقبرة جماعية في سنجار ونواحيها ولما كانت اليوم سنجار ساحة الصراعات 
ساحة الصراعات لأحزاب وجهات سياسية مختلفة بعد كل ما حدث فإن العدالة لا تأخذ مجراها في العراق كما إننا لا نرى أي محاكم ضد العناصر الداعش ومن ارتكبوا الجرائم ضد الإيزيديين وضد الإيز وضد الإنسانية أنا هنا لأذكركم بما حدث لنا وكذلك لكي أناصر من أجل القضية الإيزيدية من أجل حقوق الناجيات في العراق والعالم يجب أن يتم الاهتمام بالضحايا في كل مكان من أرجاء العالم لأن العنف لا يختلف كثيرا من مكان إلى آخر الضحايا أصدقاء في الألم أن محاسبة الداعش والداعمين لهم والداعمين لهم سوف يصبح درسا لكل لكل من يفكر في قيام بأعمال شنيعة مماثلة لما لما قامت به تنديم الداعش ضدي وضد مجتمعي. So with many thanks uh, to our colleagues uh, in Yazda, uh, I just want you to remember this testimony. Uh, I'm sure you've heard many others. When anybody talks about antiquities as a victimless crime, this what should come to mind. And I have to say, for me, kind of the, the pivotal moment in this investigation was when we visited uh, uh, Dohuk and other areas uh, in Iraq where uh, uh, Yazidi victims who escaped uh, from Sinjar currently are and speaking uh, uh, to, to, to women, uh, to men, to children about what has done to them. Uh, this kind of brings it together. That's where I will never look at an item uh, in a, in a gallery uh, that looks like it might be coming uh, from those areas that were controlled by ISIS the same way ever again. Um, so, uh, but now uh, a little bit more on uh, the specifics uh, of, of this investigation. So one of the key points and one of the key information that we did hand over to law enforcement agencies was on how the items actually get to Western markets. Because obviously it's not like, you know, an ISIS fighter packages and sends it with FedEx to the gallery, although you would be surprised how many items actually did arrive in FedEx packages uh, disguised as tiles or carpets or uh, ornaments. Um, and the customs, fr fr frankly, do not, uh, do not have the capacity to inspect all of the items. And so many of them uh, uh, just do not, do not get caught. But of course, uh, in most cases, it involves a very sophisticated network of intermediaries. Again, lots of information about this in the report with different you know, maps showing how it works. But essentially, for specifically Syria and uh, Iraq, Turkey and Lebanon uh, were the two main countries, and we spent a significant amount of time in both understanding how items get through the border, um, who controls the border areas, uh, where the smugglers uh, operates, how they work from the smugglers to the handlers to the dealers based in Lebanon, and then from Lebanon to Europe. Also, in many cases, not directly, but sometimes through United Arab Emirates, sometimes from Turkey in particular through Eastern Europe, and sometimes they go as far as Thailand before coming to Europe. So it's a complex network, but it's not uh, impossible to... Uh, you know, to, 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 to identify uh, the points in which it happens, including specific witnesses, and that's exactly what we did um, during, uh, during, our, uh, during our field work and combining it with open source research on those individuals who operate in places like United, United Arab Emirates and who are ultimately connected to dealers operating in Europe. I would pro point out two other very important points here, that in addition to uh, tracing the uh, the, the, the physical trafficking routes for antiquities. One thing uh, we looked at is uh, the online trade uh, in antiquities, which is um, uh, which is enormous. Uh, some online auctions now have their sales, you know, higher than um, you know auctions and galleries that uh, operate offline. And I would like to draw your attention to uh, uh, an organization, a project called Athar, which is uh, following these uh, very, very closely, specifically the trade on Facebook and you know on some other online platforms. This is actually uh, you know they, they've done fascinating research, some of which we uh, quote, but also what we saw through our own research online 
is that indeed uh, it's uh, it's very easy, and many of these items are publicized online, but also on uh, other social media platforms like WhatsApp, like Telegram. Uh, it's really a very big part of um, uh, of the trade, and not an easy one uh, for law enforcement agencies to access. But again, not an impossible one. And the other uh, word I would throw in there is free ports. Um, for us, it was fascinating to realize that there are these um, uh, essentially black holes uh, for holding items, not just antiquities, but antiquities included in places like Geneva, uh, Dubai, and many other places around the world where you can pretty much bring anything and keep it there until you want to sell it on the market. Um, there was uh, some attempt of crackdown uh, on this, uh, especially in Geneva. Um, and again, you know, I know there are people in the audience who looked in that uh, very, uh, very closely. Uh, but it is something that that is key to this trade because, again, as I said, there needs to be a cooling period for the items, and that's where it happens in those free ports, which are completely closed from uh, outside scrutiny unless there is essentially a search warrant um, to go in there. Um, so now how um, did the money get back to source countries, which is a hard part of the investigation, how you know those transactions occurred and how the money was transferred. So our research led us to the Hawala systems and the Hawala networks, um, which as some of you may know is an informal method of money transfer occurring without any money or data passing through uh, international financial channels. And so when we went to Turkey, we interviewed uh, sources who confirmed that the Havala system was used to trade, to trade looted antiquities. And that uh, information was corroborated by public uh, research. So um, our sources also provided certain names of Havala networks, and we worked and added information based on uh, open source research to map those networks. And you can see on the chart here um, that you know they are very interconnected, and you can see they're connected to source countries such as Syria and Iraq, um, as well as have some uh, points in uh, market countries like Belgium. Um, so how does that work in practice? Um, basically, you can be in Germany, in Belgium, and go to a Havala office and ask someone to transfer a certain amount of money to a person called a Havala Dar, which who is an intermediary, um, who usually enjoys you know, a good reputation, is trusted by their peers. And um, that person, the Havala Dar, based in Turkey, would then transfer um, cash money uh, to the source country in Syria or in Iraq to another Havala Dar. So um, in Turkey, our source told us that sometimes for you know, under a certain amount, uh, some transaction wouldn't even be under any control. Um, no one would ask you about who you are or why you are transferring that amount of money. Um, so those networks uh, that you can see on the map, they are under um, they are designated entities uh, and they are under the radar of U.S. authorities, um, and some of them have been. Um, supporting ISIL uh, allegedly according to, to US authorities. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, as, as you can see as well, some transactions um, go you know, from Syria to, to Belgium, as I, as I noted earlier. Um, you can find further detail and information in our report as well on that. I would just add one line to this is basically uh, the reason we started looking into Hawala networks is because it is very clear that at some point the money do get into official financial systems. But until they do, it all happens in cash. And for the investigations to proceed, they need on one hand, and we provided them sufficient information to do so, trace the financial transactions that go through official uh, uh, financial systems like banks, but also combine it with this type of research where we can link these transactions to specific Havala offices in the countries where uh, they operate and through which antiquities have been trafficked. And now the interesting question, um, who? And uh, before I move to the next slide, I do have to make a very, very important uh, disclaimer. Uh, in our report, you will find descriptions of specific cases, but what we cannot share publicly is which ones of the cases we're actually working on directly with law enforcement officials, with prosecutors, because it would, it could really compromise the investigation and it could unnecessarily alert the perpetrators. 
However, what we try to do uh, in the report is to give specific names uh, of dealers who operate in Europe and the United States, but based exclusively on publicly available information, on information that has been reported before by the media or in the statements made by law enforcement officials. And um, there are obviously uh, many of them. Uh, some of them, uh, if you're following the issue of, uh, you know, the art, the art world and the issue of looted antiquities, you might have heard that just 10 years, 10 days ago, uh, there's a big scandal breaking up in France, um, which uh, has to do with uh, Monsieur Martinez, uh, who is a former director of the Louvre and uh, the French ambassador for international cooperation in the issues of cultural heritage protection. And uh, he was arrested, questioned and there is an investigation opened against him. Um, it is, uh, in, in, in French, he's uh, mis en examen. Uh, that's the term that is not directly translatable uh, into English. And Manel, who is a French lawyer, can explain you uh, in great detail what it means. It means that, obviously, like everybody else, he's innocent until proven guilty. But usually it means that uh, the prosecutors, uh, the, the investigators, have some good reasons uh, to look into his uh, mm -hmm. dealings. And Martinez is very much linked to, uh, who is not mentioned in our report because that's that's new, uh, but uh, the two people mentioned in our report, three people actually mentioned in our report, Christophe Kuniki, Richard Semper, and uh, who are French from uh, Pierre Berger Auction House, and also uh, Robin Dibb, who is German, uh, are all connected with the same cases um, as Martinez. But probably the most important part that you'll see in the report uh, we really try to show how many times these individuals that we mention have been on the radar of law enforcement agencies. It literally, if you go, you'll see in 2017, in 2007, uh, you know, an um, item was confiscated from this uh, um, a dealer or from this gallery because it was looted. In uh, 2011, uh, they were caught while trying to import items into a country. In 2013, they were uh, charged with uh, forging provenance documents and so on. In each of the cases, you will see that these are people who have been literally caught red-handed multiple times. And all of them, almost without exception, continue to happily operate today. And this is something that we're really trying to break by giving law enforcement agencies more information on at least some of those cases to allow them to pr proceed with much more serious charges. The point is, and you'll see it described in the report in detail, so far, most of these cases, the vast majority of these cases, resulted in either the restitution of items, which is extremely important, returning the items to their country of origin is critically important, um, or people being fined, or uh, you know, charged with tax violations, all of that is essentially seen as the cost of doing business. And uh, what was really interesting in uh, at least some of these cases that after the items were restituted, their business actually went up because the only thing the market cared about is that the items are authentic, that they're not fake. And there was no better proof of that than the item being sent back to their country of origin, claimed by the country of origin, and being sent back. And these are just a few examples that I'm not making it up. They have been <laughs> on the radar of the media and on law enforcement for many, many years, and there are lots of examples like that uh, in the report. So to just very briefly touch on this uh, point, um, so kind of considering some of the limitations of the current approach and the paradigm, um, noting some of the things Anya just mentioned about uh, these networks being on the radar, um, our approach has instead been to um, to advocate for prosecutors bringing more serious charges of complicity in war crimes and financing terrorism uh, instead. So most countries in their criminal code, so, so what does this look like on the legal side? Um, most countries in their criminal code will have provisions for both the kind of the direct perpetrator as well as any accomplices that might be working with them. So in our case, direct perpetrators, right, would be the uh, terrorism groups or armed groups who are operating on the ground committing war crimes, committing crimes against humanity. Um, but accomplices in our case could be someone like dealers or galleries who are financing or supporting or otherwise facilitating um, the activities of those direct perpetrators. Um, and in some 
jurisdictions, there are accomplices, and some there are aiders and abettors or facilitators, but it's all sort of the same concept. Um, and so for our purposes, one of the more recent jurisprudence uh, decisions that has been uh, relevant is uh, that you, as a person or an entity, could be criminally liable as an accomplice uh, for these sorts of crimes if you knowingly um, finance them or support them, um, including uh, sending, sending money through the financial system. So this could be that you knew that these armed groups or the terrorist organizations are committing the crimes on the ground. You've heard about the crimes against humanity and the war crimes. Um, you know that the items are being looted. Um, these people, often as experts in their field, um, they were hearing about uh, you know, the items being looted. This was particularly a big topic in sort of the antiquities industry um, during that time. So they were n there, there was knowledge that this was happening. Um, and then they knew that the money that was flowing through the financial system was eventually, possibly through a few intermediaries in the process, but eventually would find their way to the armed groups on the ground in order to finance um, those crimes. Um, importantly here, just to flag, uh, you don't necessarily have to prove that the, the accomplice shared the same intent as the direct perpetrator. So what that means is for the galleries and the dealers you don't have to show that they were paying this money for the antiquities in order to commit the crimes. Um, they were paying the money to get the antiquity to be able to sell that. Um, so this knowledge standard is the is the sort of important point, and it applies to both um, international crimes charges as well as terrorism financing charges, and that is what what we advocate for. And uh, just to wrap it up and leave some time for questions. Um, the report uh, and the, the, the short summary that you have contains multiple recommendations, and we are very clear that some, you know, there are, there are many more recommendations, especially on the policy level, that have been made by our colleagues, including the Antiquities Coalition and many other organizations that are working in this space. So most of our recommendations focus on literally how to bring them to justice for serious crimes, because we do believe that this is a critical element that is missing to break this cycle, uh, to make sure that uh, the uh, the market end of this is dismantled to create sufficient deterrence, uh, which would ultimately stop the looting and, uh, as a result, protect the communities, uh, the victims, and uh, their cultural heritage. What we are going to do is to continue supporting these investigations. As I said, a lot of this information and much more has been handed over uh, to the authorities. Uh, we will. Uh, represent uh, in due course uh, the people who were affected, uh, the, the victims, the survivors um, of these crimes to make sure that they get access to justice. And we will continue to insist that uh, antiquities looting and illegal trade is not a victimless crime. And we all need to understand that it is not just about a few rich people defrauding each other. It is about the money and the weapons that are going to armed groups that threaten uh, uh, their communities in places where they operate, and frankly, through terrorism acts, all of us outside. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antonia, um, Anya, and Manel. We're now going to take questions from our in-person audience and also our online audience. We do encourage you to be rather concise and share the mic. So who's up first? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, my name is Nesma. I'm a lawyer with the Syria Justice and Accountability Center. First and foremost, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm curious to hear how open authorities have been to kind of expanding the scope of accountability beyond just the fines and the restitution. How interested have they been, and also lawmakers as well, if you've spoken to any lawmakers, if they're interested in kind of expanding criminal provisions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent question. Uh, so. Uh, Surprisingly open, I literally expected when we first worked in, walked in the prosecutor's office for them to look at us uh, without any kind of understanding what we were talking about. They were surprisingly open. Many of these authority, authorities are already looking into certain crimes committed by ISIL. It was more linking it to the people who operate uh, in their countries. So I think there is definitely openness, but we also have to remember, and you know, some of them actually uh, 
uh, were, uh, were, were, were totally ready to take action. I think we need to remember that many of these units are understaffed and underfunded, and they have lots of different crimes to deal with. You know, these are the units usually that deal with terrorism and uh, international crimes, so adding the antiquities dealers to their portfolio is not exactly something they would jump on. But this is partially why we decided, kind of unusually for us, to bring this information uh, to you, to, uh, to the journalists and also to the policymakers. We are having some uh, advocacy meetings uh, in uh, in Washington and uh, we definitely are very closely in touch with the uh, European Commission uh, that is very active. Uh, we are obviously in touch with UNESCO and many other uh, organizations that are critical in also making sure that um, that uh, these cases have the proper framework under which they can happen. Anyone else? I know we have some. We, we've a couple of online questions. I'm going to throw to my colleague Philippa down the back. Uh, thank you. So I'm going to be reading the online questions. Um, we have one from Michelle Riot, um, and she has asked, "I would like to know more about the technical process of bringing such a case of human rights violations to the corresponding High Court for the country. Um, what is the general timeline, and in your experience, what are the biggest hurdles to face in the process?" Um, uh, thank you. Uh, there's a very long answer to this question. <laughs> That's pretty much what we're you doing keep it concise, day and it. night. Um, in short, it's not easy. Uh, it takes years. Uh, the good news is that, uh, as, I, as, we, as we mentioned, we're very clear, some of these characters are already on the radar of law enforcement agencies. They have already confiscated their items. They have already opened cases against them for tax violations or, or fraud or provenance. So we do have quite a lot there already. It's more about moving it to these different set of charges, and that's exactly what we're trying to give them. Uh, that's partially why we decided to do that, because we knew that it's not going to be easy. So I always say that we have probably done about two-thirds of the investigation. Obviously, as an NGO is a private actor. There are certain things we cannot do. We cannot seize financial transactions. We cannot seize electronic communication. We cannot conduct formal interrogations, but they can. And our goal was to give them as much as possible to make sure that it happens. But it also seems like now there is an incredible momentum. When we started this work, there was very little happening in terms of uh, you know any kind of formal processes against these dealers. But now, with what's happening in France, with what's frankly happening in Switzerland, uh, with what's happening in the United States as well, uh, where in New York in particular there is a very, very active assistant district attorney, uh, Matthew Bogdanus, who brought some of these cases forward. Uh, I do think that we will see a very different picture a few years from now if that goes well. Good morning. I'm uh, Deep Harvaz with NPR. Just wondering, it, to what extent do you think there's been resistance, or you know, not so much uh, considering this to be a priority, because so many of these people who deal in these antiquities are powerful people. They have money. They move in powerful moneyed circles, and they have influence. Okay, uh, I'll just take the questions quickly. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I think what we have seen, uh, and frankly, uh, when we started doing this work, uh, when I first heard of major lobbying by uh, association of coin collectors, I frankly couldn't believe it. But then when we looked at it, it's real. Uh, you know, the, there are associations uh, that are not just uh, you know, it's not just about important people with money, it's about very significant lobbying efforts, and particularly in the United States, that was where, where lobbying is kind of probably a little bit more prominent than in some European countries, it was definitely part of the case. But in other cases, again, I really encourage you to look at some of the cases in the report, because in some, some of the cases just dissolve. There is no information after you know, somebody is caught with an item that clearly you know, is taken across the border, it's established that it's been looted, it's confiscated, the person is arrested, and then everything stops. And that's when it was fascinating. And all of our efforts to try to figure out what happened afterwards um, were essentially fertile. It just, nobody has an answer to that. The case was just, it, and there's no even a formal statement that the case was dismissed because they were, you know, not sufficient evidence was found. They just disappear. The same in the United States. You would look, you know, in certain cases when there were, I don't know, four suspects and some of them were charged, now they pled guilty, and the two others, there is nothing. And 
I do think that in many of these cases, we are talking to people who are very well connected. I mean, particularly, you know, around uh, the case of uh, Martinez in France, there are very big questions uh, what role he played in his official capacity, not just as a director of Louvre, but as the um, ambassador for these issues on the international arena in facilitating the functioning of this market. Any more questions from the room? I know we've a couple online, or maybe 200 online. <laughs> Um, hi, thank you very much. My name is Kaylee Specht. I'm a candidate for the Master of Arts in International Security at the SCAR School, um, just over in George Mason. And so I know you guys focus a lot on the responsive measures to antiquities looting, specifically in conflict regions. Um, but I was wondering if there's also any focus or research in preventative measures, being that there's usually a high association with looting, with conflict, with poverty, increased poverty rates, um, reduced education access, limited health care access, et cetera. Um, if there are any preventative measures you guys have come across that may be worthwhile taking a look at. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just answer briefly. It's, it's, um, we always, in every project that we do, and as the docket, we run many different investigations, not just antiquities, we always try to see where is our value added, right? And what is the niche? What is the gap that we can fill? And in this one, we definitely felt that as lawyers, as investigators, we should focus on what can be done on the uh, legal and prosecutorial side of things, as opposed, uh, or less so on policy measures. And that's because there are multiple other organizations, starting from UNESCO and European Commission and multiple NGOs that focus on protective measures and prevention of looting. There is lots of trainings being organized even by NATO, for example, about how cultural heritage needs to be treated during conflict. So this is happening. I think it is relatively good. From our side, the only aspect of it is meeting with authorities in countries like Lebanon, like Turkey, like uh, you know, Kurdish administration, uh, to make sure that they are aware of this work and they're aware of the opportunities that are there to stop this through legal means. And so their cooperation will be absolutely critical, and we've seen it in some of the cases that we started. Their cooperation, the authorities in transit countries, the authorities on source, in source countries, will be absolutely critical to the success of these cases. This is not something European or American prosecutors can do alone. Great, let's take a couple of questions from our online pals, Philippa, if that's okay. Um, so a quick disclaimer that there are a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to all of them, but we will try to reply via email um, as much as possible. There's a few questions about a copy of the report. You can all go to cfj.org, and the report is front and center on the front page. For anyone listening online, um, you can find all the information there. So um, to some uh, questions that we, that we can take. Um, as you mentioned, U.S. and European dealers of these trafficked artifacts should be charged for their role in financing terrorism. Should the same apply to big tech platforms that knowingly facilitate this war crime? Um, that's from uh, Katie Paul. No? Okay, uh, so uh, that's fine. Um, so uh, we, it's. Uh, our research focused mainly on individuals, partially because they're easier to prosecute, to be frank. So we're slightly going for a slightly lower hanging fruit, not the lowest one by any by any chance. But actually, uh, Katie Paul, and that's why you know I would really encourage you to go uh, and look at Adhar Project. She's one of the directors of this project, uh, and that's definitely again something that they've been very much focused on, looking at online platforms, including Facebook. My take on that is at this point, I think we could use these online platforms to uh, facilitate these ongoing investigations because the information, the data they hold will be critical in identifying some of these transactions. And it's not easy, as we all know, but it is uh, some level of engagement at this point I think would be critical. Of course, if at any point it will be established and proven through an investigation that you know, Facebook marketplace profited from these illegal sales, they would be in the same position as any other uh, suspect. But so far, I do think there is uh, still an opportunity to engage, uh, which, which we are actually trying to do with some of these platforms to facilitate going after the biggest fish uh, in the art market who are involved in illegal antiquities trade. Yeah, we take another question online. 
is possibly quite a nice one to wrap up, as I know we are nearly at our, at our end. Um, from Philip Grant at Trial International, um, where do we go from here? Um, what is the legal strategy to go after those who participate in the looting of antiquities uh, like in the long term? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, there are many ways in going about it, and you know, we discussed some of that, and some of that is happening. Our uh, proposal, our pitch, our work has really focused on criminal investigations with, seri with serious charges, which would hopefully create a deterrent effect. It is hard to tell. These cases will take some time. It is hard to tell uh, who, in the end, uh, will face trial, let alone be convicted. But what we do think is critically important is for the investigators, for the prosecutors in key jurisdictions to stop seeing the looting and trade in antiquities as just part of the art crime world to really expand their, their view of how these crimes are treated to potential complicity in what's happening on the ground in those countries. These links uh, are there. Uh, we try to give them as much uh, information as possible and continue to support it. But of course, in many ways, the ball is now in their court. And we do hope that this publicity and more if you like, buzz around this issue, the more importance, the more pr prominence it's given uh, in the media and in the public debate will actually support those prosecutors who are committed to taking this strategy forward. Great, great question to take us home. Thank you very, very much, everybody who has made the effort to be with us here in DC today and to all of our online friends and colleagues. We encourage all of you to go to cfj.org to read the report in full. It is a bulky document, but it is an interesting one. So please do that. And if you have any questions or media requests, drop us an email at media at cfj.org where myself, Shauna or Philippa will answer you um, possibly after a few days because it's rather clogged. But uh, thank you again and we will hope to see you soon.